Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one and welcome back to Mingles with Jingles where this week I must get this out of the way right at the beginning otherwise I'll just forget again. This was actually something that I was supposed to talk about in last week's episode of Mingles with Jingles but um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of crap and I forgot. In fact, just as an example of how incredibly crap I am I should probably explain what it is that I'm actually talking about first. They're actually written and published by a couple of YouTubers that I'm pretty sure most of you have probably heard of. You've probably seen their videos. Military Aviation History and Military History Visualized. A couple of German YouTubers. Um, their stuff is really, really good. Very well researched and presented. Well, they've gotten their heads together and they've, uh, they've written one book and they're publishing another. And I'll tell you about the books themselves in a moment. First, I want to explain just how crap I am. So as I'm sitting here in front of my PC at my work desk. On one side of the desk, literally right in front of me, on the left side of the desk, I have the book Stuka, The Doctrine of the German Dive Bomber by Christoph Bergs and Bernhard Kast. That's military aviation history and military history visualized. This is the one that they've written and are publishing themselves. And then on the other side of my desk, like literally on the right hand side of my keyboard, the second book, IS2. Development, Design and Production of Stalin's Warhammer by Peter Samsonov. This is the one that they're publishing. They're literally right in front of me. And I still forgot to talk about them. <laughs> That's how shit I am. Um, but I'm, I'm going to get it done today, this time. I've already started, so I'm unlikely to forget at this point, although anything's possible. So, anyway, yeah, the first book, Stuka, The Doctrine of the German Dive Bomber. This is the book that the two of them, Christoph and Bernhard... Oh, Bernhard's not German, he's Austrian. <laughs> My apologies, Austria. Oh, that must be really, really annoying. I suppose it happens a lot. Yeah, he's German. No, he's not, he's Austrian. Ah, same thing. Um, yeah, they've gotten their heads together and they have researched, written, and are publishing this one themselves. And... It's a really, really impressive piece of work. They translated all of this stuff into English from the original German. So a lot of the stuff in this book is stuff that has never been translated into English before. And there is so much in here. It's all about the tactics, the doctrine, organization, training and operational experience with the Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber as well as their own research into the design, the development and the operational use of the dive bomber. They've also translated, for example, the actual original Luftwaffe training manual on how to dive bomb with the Ju-87, reports from operations in Poland, the Soviet Union and Crete where the aircraft was used, numerous essays on the aircraft, its production, its legacy and its operations during the Second World War. All of this stuff translated from the original German, probably for the very first time ever. Um, there's information in here that if you're not a German speaker, you just cannot get anywhere else. It's a really good book and I am very, very happy to recommend it to you. That's Stuka, The Doctrine of the German Dive Bomber by Christoph Bergs, better known as Military Aviation History, and Bernhard Kast, not German, <laughs> in fact Austrian, better known as Military History Visualized. As well as that, they're also publishing another book, which I just mentioned, on the IS-2, Development, Design and Production of Stalin's Warhammer by Peter Samsonov. Uh, who's a Russian-Canadian engineering manager. Uh, this, I believe, is not the first book that he's actually written, but it's the first one that uh, is now being published by two YouTubers, and it goes through the everything that you ever wanted to know about the IS-2, and not just the IS-2, but why the Russians wanted a heavy tank in the first place, and all the design and development of other heavy tanks that went into what eventually became the IS-2. And much like the other book on the Stuka, um, most of the information in the IS-2 book was gleaned from primary sources in Russia, which Peter translated into English and is publishing in this book. Uh, the information in both of these books is just absolutely incredible. And if you have the slightest interest in World War II military history, specifically, obviously, the Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber and the IS-2 heavy tank, then I have no hesitation whatsoever in recommending both of these books to you. Link down below in the video description to where you can actually get your hands on them. Speaking of being incredibly crap, <laughs> you've probably noticed a certain young gnome 
in the background of today's video. That is Twinkie Pie. What? Don't laugh. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with her name. Twinkie Pie is a perfectly respectable gnome name, okay? Yeah, she's my brand new level 80 gnome protection warrior. Although she was only level 77 at the time I was recording this. Um, so what's this got to do with being crap jingles? Well, there's a bit of a story behind this. <laughs> so <laughs> Strap yourselves in, make yourself comfortable, and I'll tell you. So shortly after reaching level 80, uh, once I'd thrown a bit of gold at the auction house and bought some gear and run a few dungeons and gotten uh, gear sufficient to ensure that when she's tanking a raid boss, she's not going to get critted to death. Um, I started queuing up for some of the easier raids. So Twinkie Pie found herself tanking in what's what they, there's a lot of whole bunch of abbreviations that they use in chat when they're looking for people to join groups for raids and stuff. So it can be very confusing and overwhelming when you don't understand the abbreviations. So she joined a group for what's known as OS102D. Yeah, I'd, I'd said it was going to be confusing, but that basically means Obsidian Sanctum, 10 man raid, two drakes up. So Further explanation obviously required here. What that means, um, the Obsidian Sanctum raid, which is available in two versions, 10-man or 25-man, um, is a sort of choose-your-own-difficulty fight. It consists of one big dragon boss called Sartharian with three lesser drakes. And you determine how tough the fight is going to be and therefore how good the rewards are going to be by deciding how many dragons you want to fight at the same time. So when you enter the raid, the big boss, Sartharian, is kind of sitting there in the middle of the area. And if you ignore him for the moment and you go around the outside of the whole area where the other three drakes are, Vesperon, Shadron and Tenebron, and you kill them individually, then when you fight Sartharian, it's just Sartharian, right? Because you've killed the other three. But the loot that you get will be of lesser value and there won't be as much of it. Now, that's what's known as an OS-10 0D fight. Obsidian Sanctum, 10-man raid with zero additional dragons. If you decide that you want to fight Sartharian with one additional drake up, then you kill two of the additional drakes, and then as soon as you engage Sartharian, the surviving drake joins the fight, which makes things harder, but then you get more loot. But Sartharian himself, with one extra drake, whichever extra drake you choose, is still relatively easy. I mean, it's not as easy as killing him with no extra drakes up, but it's still pretty simple. And most groups usually don't do that. They go for the next step up. OS 10 2D, Obsidian Sanctum, with two additional drakes up. And this is pretty challenging especially for the tanks. Well, one of the tanks. I'll explain why in a moment. Um, but the loot rewards are much, much better. Now, the ridiculously difficult end of the spectrum is doing OS 10 3D with all three of the drakes up. So you're fighting not just Sartharian, but the three drakes, Shadron, Tenebron, and Vesperon as well. And it is really tough. There's an insane amount of damage going around because each of the drakes introduces a new mechanic to the fight. I, I can already feel your eyes glazing over. Don't worry, I'm not going to explain the minute technical details of exactly what happens in the fight. You just need to know that it's it's tough. It's so tough that if you manage to complete it, you get a title and uh, a guaranteed drop of a flying mount. So, yeah. Most, most raids go for two drakes. And it's still pretty tough on the tanks. Well, one of the tanks. <laughs> the, the, the tank that isn't tanking Sartharian. Tanking Sartharian himself, the big dragon, is easy. You basically just stand in one spot and stay alive. There are some minor mechanics that you have to avoid, but it, it's, it's simple. I've done it numerous times on my Death Knight tank, Scythica. And Death Knights are very, very good at tanking Sartharian because they have resistances against magic damage like the dragon's breath attack. They have... Uh, self heals uh, and very very strong single target threat generation so if you've got a death knight tank in your raid group you probably want the death knight to be tanking Sartharian himself and we had a death knight tank in this uh, raid group uh, we didn't know it at the time this was the first time he'd ever been in a raid 
I mean, technically it was the first time I'd ever been in a raid, but it was the first time I'd been in a raid on Twinkie Pie. I've done many, many raids on other characters, so I knew what to do. Uh, but this was the first time, because he didn't say anything, of course. <laughs> this was the first time this Death Knight tank had been in a raid ever on any character, which became quite apparent the first time we... Uh, pulled Sartorian himself, the way he was positioning the boss was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you standing there? Um, so things didn't go too well. Um, but we established that he didn't really know what he was doing, and that was fine, so, you know, we explained it to him, you know, pull the, pull the boss to here, and then move to here, and then tank him in this star. You know, you get the idea. Once that was sorted, we had no problems whatsoever. Um, easy job, like I said. Now, Twinkie Pie is not a Death Knight tank. She's a warrior tank. And warrior tanks are good at tanking single target boss fights as well, but they're much, much better than Death Knights when it comes to tanking multiple targets at the same time. I mean, a Death Knight tank can tank multiple targets at the same time, but the Death Knight struggles to hold aggro on multiple targets at the same time. They're not that good at generating threat and holding aggro on a whole bunch of bad guys at the same time. Whereas warriors are really good at that sort of thing. Um, so, of course, Twinkie Pie got stuck with the job of tanking the Drakes while the Death Knight tanked Sartharian himself. It's not just the Drakes, though. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that needs to be tanked. And this is where the being incredibly crap part. <laughs> Don't worry. Nobody died. It's not that bad. So, anyway, the, the, the fight starts. Um, the... Death Knight starts tanking the big boss Sartharian off in the corner of the, of the room. And um, the first of the two surviving dragons, because we're doing it with two drakes up, the first of the two drakes lands. And I immediately grab this drake and then try to put it into a safe position and start tanking it. The healers start pumping heals out, and the DPS, you know, everybody who's not a tank or a healer, immediately switches to this drake. Because you've got one minute, and then the second drake is going to join the fight. And if the first drake isn't dead by the time that happens, now suddenly I have a second drake that I have to pick up and tank at the same time. And sometimes you'll be in a raid group that has good enough DPS that um, the first drake is dead before the second one lands, in which case it's easy mode for the tank. Well, relatively easy mode for the tank because there's other stuff going on. Like I said, each of these additional drakes introduces new mechanics to the fight, like dozens of dragon whelps which all also have to be tanked while you're tanking the one or possibly two of the additional drakes, because if nobody generates threat on them, then they just go straight for the healers, and the healers die, and then everybody else dies. Oh, and did I mention the fire elementals? <laughs> there are all these lesser fire elementals that spawn as well. They also have to be tanked. And uh, there's a flame wall mechanic where walls of flame will sweep across the area. And if any of these lesser fire elementals get hit by a wall of flame, they turn into greater fire elementals. <laughs> so picture the scene. Uh, the DPS was not spectacular. It wasn't bad. It was fine, but it wasn't spectacular. So I'm tanking the first drake, which hadn't died by the time the second drake arrived. So I'm tanking two drakes, plus trying to establish threat and hold aggro on all of the dragon whelps that are spawned and all of the fire elementals. The other death knight, right, the, the other tank, he's just sitting in the corner tanking the boss, right? It's easy for him, but it was an utter nightmare for me. Generally in a raid, when you're fighting a boss, you only really need one tank for a lot of those boss fights. It's, it's a single tank fight, but you do need to have another tank. Maybe even another two tanks, depending on the size of the raid, because there's 25-man versions of the raids as well, which are harder. And some of the fights require three tanks. But generally speaking, you'll put your best tank, known as the main tank, on the boss, and then one, possibly two off tanks, depending on the fight, uh, to grab any, what they call them adds, additional things that need to be tanked. Um, like, for example, in the Sartharian fight, where you've got two drakes, a whole bunch of... <laughs> dragon whelps and a whole bunch of fire elementals as well. Um, but in the 10-man version, you can't afford to take three tanks in, otherwise you won't have enough DPS to kill everything. So one tank, the off tank, actually has the hardest job. The main tank's job is easy on Sartori, and you just stand in the corner and tank the boss. The off tank definitely has the harder job. But as a warrior tank, Twinkie Pie did have a whole bunch of tools available uh, that made it certainly not easy, but easier. 
She can do, for example, a thunderclap, which generates a sort of shockwave around her that does a huge amount of threat. Um, she can also do a shockwave, which is a cone attack that does a huge amount of damage and a huge amount of threat and also stuns everything in front of her. Then she can do demoralizing shout, which reduces the attack power of everything around her so that they do less damage. So I'm spamming all of these abilities, right, trying to maintain aggro on the two drakes, trying to gather up as many of the whelps as possible, and, um, and the fire elementals, of course, while also trying to stay alive. So I'm spamming my shield block ability to take the damage off, or to take the edge off incoming damage. I'm spamming demoralizing shout to reduce the amount of damage that everything's doing to me and so on and so on and so on. And it worked, you know, it, it, was, it was tough, but it worked. And then the two drakes were down and then we'd killed all of the whelps and the, but the fire elementals continue to spawn. So the fire elementals did need to still be tanked. But at that point, it's easy mode. The most critical moment is when that second drake lands. If you're still tanking the first one, plus all the whelps, plus the fire elementals, once you get over that hurdle and it's just Sartharian, all of the DPS can switch to him. Uh, the healers can start breathing a sigh of relief because they don't have to worry about everybody taking damage at the same time. And you just burn Sartharian down, collect your loot and go home. But fire elementals do continue to spawn. So as the off tank, I still had to keep an eye open for them and make sure that they didn't eat any of the healers while avoiding things like the firewalls that sweep across the area, so on and so on. But it's pretty easy at this point. You know, once you've done all of that, you're going you're gonna to do it. All right? It's just burn Sartharian down, take care of the fire elementals, collect your loot and go home. This is the part where I did something really stupid. <laughs> I did the hard part. Um, <laughs> and it was really hard. It was a hell of a challenge, but I did it. And you see, here's the thing. Uh, one character class available is Shaman. And, a sh and you know, this is another one of those words that you see written down, but nobody ever uses in conversation. And I've, I've heard people pronounce it two different ways. I say Shaman, but I've heard people say Shaman. And honestly, I have no idea how it's pronounced. But whatever, anyway. So Shaman can summon a fire elemental as a pet. And it does a huge amount of damage. You know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> I spent almost the entire second half of this fight trying to tank the Shaman's Fire Elemental pet, because it's a Fire Elemental, and Fire Elementals continued to spawn. And, <laughs> and I thought, oh no, there's a great a Fire Elemental up. But I couldn't seem to target this. <laughs> I didn't understand what was going on. So I'm thinking, what's going on? Is this thing bugged? I can't target it. So I started spamming all of my area of effect threat generating abilities. I'm doing demoralizing shout. I'm doing thunderclap. I'm trying to hit it with my shockwave and nothing's working. <laughs> this thing's just ignoring me. <laughs> it was the shaman's fire elemental pet. <laughs> I mean... You know, it didn't really matter at that point because <laughs> as the off tank, my job was basically done uh, once the two drakes and all the whelps were dead. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think anybody noticed. <laughs> and I'm sure you lot won't tell anybody. <laughs> so sometimes I am so shit. <laughs> I astonish even myself. <laughs> Yeah, and I'd done really, really well on that fight because it is a really hard fight to off tank. And then I kind of, I mean, it's not like I screwed everything up <laughs> because, like I said, my job was basically done at that point. But it was kind of amusing. <sighs> anyway, yeah. So, so that's what I got up to this weekend. <laughs> uh, so, what now? Uh, anyway, meanwhile. In other news, YouTube are up to their old tricks again. <laughs> so they've been cracking down on swearing lately, apparently. I'm reading this from uh, PCGamer.com's website. You know what? This would explain so much. 
So apparently new rules that came into effect in November last year, not that long ago, only a couple of months, but it's worrying that I'm hearing about it from PCGamer.com and not from YouTube themselves, but they've introduced new rules regarding profanity. So now, if your video contains profanity in the title, thumbnail, swearing in the first seven seconds of the video, or consistently throughout the video, whatever the hell that means, your video is now very likely to get demonetized. Also, apparently, YouTube have now decided that all swear words are basically the same and are treated the same, so it doesn't matter whether you're dropping F-bombs or you're just saying shit. It's all the same as far as YouTube's concerned, because of course it is. Oh, no, I said shit. Oh, well, in for a penny, in for a pound. I, mean, I may as well say fuck now. <laughs> YouTube's algorithm doesn't see a difference. Not that it matters in Mingles with Jingles anyway, because I don't monetize these videos anyway, but yeah, yeah. And, and here's the kicker. This is, this is the best part. Apparently YouTube introduced these new rules in November. They're definitely in effect now, this much I know. But they're applying it retroactively to every video you have ever uploaded, because of course they are. So, content creators, here's a change that's going to affect your livelihood. You need to be aware of this going forward. No, by the way, we're applying it to everything that you have ever done on the platform, ever. Here's something that you may find amusing. So, voice actor and YouTuber Sung Won Cho, again, this from the PCGamer.com news article on the subject, Sung Won Cho ran a sort of experiment in a video called YouTube is Run by Fools. He explained the new guidelines while very carefully avoiding cursing for the first 15 or so seconds of his video before proceeding to curse four times later on. Despite the fact that his profanity occurred after the first 15 seconds of his video and made up only a tiny percentage of the overall script, the video was demonetized two days later. So, YouTube strikes again in their ongoing and never-ending quest to drive their own service into the ground and make it impossible for anybody to upload anything and make a living out of doing it. Don't forget YouTube itself. I mean, I just don't understand. They, they don't make any advertising money off demonetized videos. Yeah, if a video is demonetized, then no adverts get run on it, and YouTube also makes no money from it. Oh, hang on a second. I just remembered something. I don't know if you recall, about a year ago, I was discussing a change to the YouTube terms of use, uh, specifically monetizing videos. I mean, Mingles with Jingles is not monetized. I don't run ads on Mingles with Jingles. This is a thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. Thank you, by the way, everybody who supports me on Patreon. So, by default, I turn advertising off on Mingles with Jingles. And if you're a small YouTube channel, not big enough to apply for and join the YouTube Partner Program and start monetizing your own videos, then, you know, obviously you don't see any advertising revenue from your videos. But YouTube can. Even on videos that have been demonetized or are not eligible for monetization, YouTube changed the rules about a year ago to give themselves the right to run adverts on videos that shouldn't have any advertising. <laughs> so, for example, even though Mingles with Jingles is not monetized, some of you may see adverts on it. But I don't see any advertising revenue from that. It all goes to YouTube. Ah, suddenly everything's starting to make sense. So YouTube can change the rules on profanity, resulting in thousands and th probably hundreds of, maybe even millions of videos suddenly being demonetized. But that doesn't mean they're not going to run adverts on them. <laughs> it just means they're not going to share any of the money with the people that put the work into creating those videos in the first place. Ah, right, yes. Yeah, it's all, it's all becoming very clear now. Suddenly it does actually make sense. Good job, YouTube. YouTube strikes again. And on that bombshell, that's it for this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you all had a great weekend. Uh, don't forget to check out the links in the video description of those two books that I talked about at the beginning. IS2, Development, Design and Production of Stalin's Warhammer by Peter Samsonov. And Stuka, The Doctrine of the German Dive Bomber by Christoph Bergs, also known as Military Aviation History on YouTube. And Bernhard Kast, the not German, he's actually Austrian, also known on YouTube as Military History Visualized. That's it for today. Have a good one, take care, and I'll catch you next time.